Welcome to a fantastic edition of Rebellion's Educational Series. I'm here with the leading machine learning mind, Professor Matthew Dixon of the Illinois Institute of Technology. Now, I've been following Professor Dixon for nearly a decade. His Bayesian Networks paper caught my attention back in 2012. And quite frankly, I have been learning from Matthew ever since. And I would recommend everyone learn from Matthew and check out his work on SSRN and follow him on LinkedIn. But today I want to talk about uh, buy-side applications of machine learning. Uh, Matthew, uh, where do you see buy-side applications of machine learning occurring? Let's, uh, let's take it to your slides. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, I've had the pleasure um, of working at many different um, buy-side firms. So actually, this is really um, the main area of my, my research. Um, worked for private equity firms. Uh, the paper you mentioned on Bayesian Networks actually how to uh, sort of streamline private equity investment. Advising trading companies, HFTs, um, asset management firms. Um, so I've seen a lot of buy side um, activity over the years. I've been a risk manager in that area as well for a hedge fax, a, a software company. Um, and, one of the things that I've noticed is that um, it's a very, uh, you know, it's a very uh, sort of eat what you can kill kind of field. Um, and you need to really understand that the opportunities um, for making money in that space um, are, you know, oftentimes, you know, a closed opportunities. And there isn't necessarily always a lot of data on the things that you want um, to, uh, to invest in. And so I think, I think what's, what's really worth sort of commenting on here is how excited the buy side got about deep learning, you know, five, six, seven years ago when deep learning became a really big thing. So at the time, if you remember, just cast your mind back 2016, everyone was excited about AlphaGo, you know, the, the vision of self-driving cars. We just had speech recognition, uh, deep learning successfully deployed. It seemed that deep learning was going to be pervasive in every aspect of our life. And if you kind of fast track to where we are now, I think we've learned a lot of things from that. I mean, I think there's been a lot of disappointment and there's been a lot of, and there's been some success stories. And I think the buy side has really um, grappled with this. Um, and I think, you know, one of the areas where I think the, the buy side really struggled with adoption of deep learning in, in a really, in, in the way that really did justice to deep learning is understanding um, you know, the, the, the kind of trade-offs between, on the one hand, having a plug and play model, the Silicon Valley sort of vision, you, no experts needed, you plug in a bunch of inputs, you get a bunch of outputs. Um, there's great tooling, so just download it, it's free. Um, it's had lots of brilliant people working on it. So you're really building on, a, a, you're tapping into a community of very talented developers and trying to hot start a whole area of technology. The problem was it just requires a lot of finessing to actually make it work. And it has a lot of complexity and none of this is really taught in any finance program at the time. Most people who worked in the industry had a very superficial understanding initially. And I think what we've come to realize is that, you know, over time, um, many of these sort of developments in deep learning were really pretty much variants of things that we already knew. Um, for example, Recurrent neural networks were really just extensions of autoregressive models, which you know the buy side already knew about. I think the, the main takeaway, what well, the main development was along short-term memory and the gated recurrent unit. These gave the ability to handle non-stationary data. A lot of time series methods required uh, stationary data. Um, and that's been really the Achilles heel of a lot of prediction tools, a lot of passing classification type tools that were used prior to sort of deep learning is you needed stationarity. If using support vector machines, you needed stationary data. Long short-term memory gated recurrent units changed the whole playing field there. You no longer needed that. The question is, you know, how well did that work? Um, and so, you know, I spent quite a bit of time actually trying to understand when the long short-term memory architectures can work. So it, you can do statistical tests of, to determine you know, how well these things are working, um, how much memory they're actually capturing, um, and you know, what's their, how much autoregressive signal are they leaving on the table that they didn't capture. And of course, you know, 
you would only really want to deploy one of these things when you need it. And not all time series data is, station, is non-stationary. So I think we've learned a lot and there's still a long way to go. Um, and you know, I look at this like a mathematician. These are all building blocks into a much bigger, longer term road roadmap um, where we really have a vision of how these different uh, you know, neural networks perform certain tasks better than others and where they're going to be useful. So that's sort of lesson one is that, you know, we learned a lot about it. Some of, some of these tools really didn't provide much more than what PCA was providing, for example, if you look at auto encoders. Um, and then of course, the big one was text, being able to handle text, alternative data. That was, I think the major uh, advancement as well as being able to you know, actually work with these kind of skip gram architectures to do um, you know, speech uh, type prediction uh, and in particular predicting certain events from words. So if you, you know, if you have certain words appearing in your newsfeed, you could predict you know, changes in the stock market, um, you know, the stock symbol uh, tied to that. Now, I think we just didn't get it right personally. Um, and I think the big problem is a lot of machine learning is really built on this sort of plug and play engineering sort of storyline. You know, you have a bunch of inputs, you have a bunch of decisions that need to be made, and then you have a set of configurations. And, and the rest is just, you know, go ahead and, and learn these rules. This is sort of the idea behind, you know, the mantra of algorithmic trading. Yeah, and the first question that comes to my mind is to ask you how many layers, you know, for the architecture of a convolutional neural network you would use, you know, typically. So it's pretty much, you know, my first question is kind of a, a widget and spoke related question. So yeah. or plug and play, as you mentioned. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's actually theory now to answer that question. It's not um, completely foolproof theory, but it's worth reminding ourselves why we need deep networks. Um, you know, if you just, there's a theorem, universal representation theorem that says you only need one layer. And so that actually says you don't need deep networks. Um, you can approximate any function with one layer. And that's true, you can. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that's a result that goes back, you know, back to Kolmogorov and, uh, you know, and, 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 and Arnold. Um, and so, you know, these are really old results, um, you know, from Russian mathematicians 100 years ago, almost. Um, but the, the main idea, I think, is that you can, for the same number of neurons, it's better to have depth than breadth. And it turns out that you have much more expressibility <clears throat> if you layer on the layers. So if I, you know, if I double up the number of layers versus adding more layers or adding more neurons to one layer, I get much more expressibility. I can, I can construct much more sort of wiggly lines uh, than I could if I just you know, double the number of neurons in one layer. So it's a very efficient mechanism the building a, a representative architecture. Yeah, wiggly lines are very important for how our markets have evolved over the last decade, in my opinion. Yeah, wiggly lines, exactly. So you want to be able to capture, you know, very unusual services, spikes and so on um, in, you know, in the surface. And it works very well. Um, and so it's an efficiency reason. And that there is no exact answer to, to this problem of how many layers I need. Well, you need, it depends on how many neurons you want. And it depends on what error tolerance you're prepared to put up with. Are you okay with 1% error? You know, that determines in some sense how many layers and how many neurons you need. Um, so it's a, there, there is theory now uh, for addressing that and actually give a whole kind of lecture on um, talk on, on that topic of how you use theory um, to, to answer that question. But ultimately, it is, a, it is a game of making something very wiggly, very quickly. Um, and you do it by composition rather than um, adding on additional polynomial terms to your linear regression. So that was another big shift. You know, hedge fund managers, asset managers, if they wanted to capture interaction effects, they would add on quadratic terms. Maybe they're in a third order term. Deep learning came along and all of a sudden you've got all the you know, higher order terms you need built in right from the beginning. You didn't have to add those things on manually. Um, and so you, you, you didn't have to play these, you know, little silly games um, with trying to capture the nonlinearity yourself. It does it for you automatically. Uh, no, capturing the nonlinearity is really one of the most difficult aspects of creating alpha in finance. So, 
How do you feel about reinforcement learning? My friend Igor Halperin is a gigantic fan of it. And, you know, it's, uh, it's you know, maybe in 2020, there were more, you know, Q learning papers than almost anything else, I think, that came out. Yeah, I, I think it's, it, you know, it's obviously, you know, having that, capturing that feedback effect is very important, you know, whether it's, um, you know, any, any action that is taken from the model, which changes the state of the environment, whether it's placing a limit order in a limit order book, uh, changes your, your in, you know, the limit order book state. I think any, ultimately, if your, if your model changes the state of what you're observing, you need reinforcement learning. Um, and so I think it's, it, you know, yeah, great it's, point, uh, great point, Professor. It, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, um, yeah, it's a very useful tool. I think the problems you get into. It's are, very superficial. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's superficial. Um, and the problems you get into is it's actually quite hard to back test um, with reinforcement learning because by definition in reinforcement learning, you're simulating all the data. You know, once you've, change the state you're no longer working with historical data anymore you've 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 now changed something that was in historical data you've now got to simulate out all this new market data um and some people don't like that uh you know they want to stay with the historical data set and it's really difficult to get back testing tools to work with reinforcement learning so um, and it's because, you know, this, this very reason that back testing tools just don't allow this market data to be generated, um, it, you know, as a, as a state changes. But ultimately, I think it's really very important to make back testing tools work with reinforcement learning. So jumping to a very 30,000 foot question, have you seen the cell side embrace machine learning much? Yeah. So um, I was going to say a bit more about um that as well. Um, so, you know, I think the cell side is obviously more regulated. Um, and the cell side seems to have got caught up with interpretability. Um, you know, it's somehow some somewhere somebody said who's a regulator or otherwise, the rate determining step of this field is going to be interpretability. And that has actually killed, in my opinion, the whole field. It's really very sad. Um, it, it is. It went from being an area where it could have been very aggressive with its, um, you know, experimentation, trying all these different models, trying to understand them, moving forward, not letting regulation be the, you know, having the final say on the what. Of course, it's important, but that shouldn't determine the rate of R and D. Um, and I think the problem is, is that interpretability got confused with auditability, and interpretability is when you really need to understand every single parameter in your model. You don't need that for deep learning. Auditability is if you have a set of inputs, can you reproduce the output? You know, in other words, can I reproduce this model if I need to, so that a regulator can say, you know, that you can reproduce all your decisions that you've made. And if it had been framed that way, I think it would be five years ahead of where it is now. Instead, it got caught up on interpretability and it used that as an excuse to be lazy and not adopt the technology. Um, so this conservative mindset of cell side is absolutely killing it. Um, and I think there are so many very interesting ways, especially when you look at how risk is, is measured across the portfolio as an industry standard, as set by Basel III for banks. It's using extremely primitive tooling, making all sorts of assumptions that just aren't valid about the data. And we measure our risk, entire banking system, on models that broke during the last financial crisis, and it made superficial adjustments to these kind of models. And I really think that the whole industry just needs a massive overhaul. Um, and I really hope that that happens in, in my lifetime. There's a fundamental misunderstanding about it overweights the importance of historical data. It doesn't understand bias variance trade-offs. Um, and so, what we're grappling with is this old school mindset of you give me a parametric distribution, you know, and I come up with, you know, a nice little cute description of what the risk is. Um, Taleb, of course, is very vocal about this. <laughs> it's very critical of, of risk management, but I think we could do so much with it. So for example, here's some work we did where we decided that we would fit um, to option prices and build a local volatility model to actually regularize the machine learning model. 
So the local volatility itself, we then put limits and barriers on it. Um, and we, we built in the no arbitrage constraints into the machine learning model. That was the major development in this work that just recently came out in uh, the Science Financial Math uh, Journal. And interestingly, if you just took an off the shelf, um, this is actually a Gaussian process model. So it's a Bayesian model. If you took, if you didn't embed the no arbitrage constraints and you look at the uncertainty in your prediction of the, what the price is, you get the right, you get the, what's on the right hand side. This is the confidence interval, massive discrepancy or ma huge wide uh, uncertainty band. Um, and if you look on the left, this is building in the no arbitrage constraint. This is the 95%, not fifth percent confidence interval. So very sharp estimates by building in the actual modeling constraints, which we know have to be satisfied. And, you know, it also illustrates just how poor the data is. If you look at these red dots, that's the data you get on this S&P you know, 500 option surface. What about all the other data points? It's, it's, it's completely foolish to think that you can fit something across a surface when you have so few data points. So we have this problem, which is ubiquitous in finance, in that we don't have good data all the time. We think we do, but we don't. And therefore we really need to combine models of the markets, things that work and integrate those into machine learning. Uh, and that's what a major part of my research focuses on is how to do that. So you get the best of both worlds. You get the best of all the math that keeps people happy, the regulators happy and so on, but you get the power of machine learning in its ability to capture, uh, you know, nonlinearity in the data and so on. Um, and, uh, and ultimately, you know, all the tooling that comes with it. Professor, what about bad actors in trading? Are we applying machine learning yet to capture bad actors? Yeah, so that, this brings me sort of to the last, uh, you know, sort of topic in a sense. And, um, you know, another area which I think is a very exciting um, area is, is actually how to use machine learning to, um, to capture uh, you know, detect those that are sort of involved in pump and dump schemes, any forms of market manipulation. Um, and we've actually looked more recently at how Chinese Bitcoin mining farms are manipulating data. Um, and what we did is we took the entire transaction graph uh, and we tried to identify which mine, where, where the miners are and when they pay into their wallets, are they no. doing it before um, there's a dip in the market. In other words, they could be informed. And what we found is we used a technique called topological data analysis, a machine learning technique. It's very well suited to graphical data. Um, and what we found is that um, we were able to uh, essentially identify outliers, particular groups of miners through this tool called TDA Mapper um, and figure out which ones seemed very probable to be informed. In other words, they seem to have some knowledge of the hash rates um, before it, it, you know, hash rates are strongly correlated with, um, with Bitcoin prices. They seem to have some knowledge of the hash rates and they're acting and in, that's our hypothesis and they're acting on that information and they're essentially trading or selling their Bitcoin before it dips um, and before a crash, like we saw in, in April or May with the Chinese uh, power grid outage, for example. Um, which really motivated this work. So it, there's a lot of tooling which is now being used to capture or detect, um, you know, bad actors. And I think it's very exciting when you combine blockchain with machine learning, you've got all this sort of graphical transaction data, you can start to say something very interesting about, you know, um, you know criminal activity. Well, this has been a phenomenal show, Professor. I, uh, I, I really... Uh, I'm so appreciative of you donating your time to us today. And do you want to give any parting words to our audience? Yeah, I think, um, you know, when I sort of come back to, uh, you know, what it is that I wanted to say, really, um, I think, I think, you know, we've still got to really rethink how we apply deep learning, um, think about it in uh, is more as part of a, a sort of a blueprint for how to modernize financial applications rather than just being lots of sort of independent efforts. Uh, and I do think that we'll see increasingly that machine learning will be the tool to, uh, to deal with problems with, uh, you know, cybercrime, cybersecurity, um, and ultimately 
I think that right now Ethereum blockchain isn't well suited to running machine learning on it, but I do think the new variant of Web3 type scale blockchains like Solana are very well suited to machine learning. We're going to see an explosion of machine learning on blockchain and those applications being fired off in the areas of um, you know, trading and, and so on um, as it all migrates over to blockchain. So very exciting to see you know, machine learning progress so far since where it was six years ago. I think the next chapter will involve a lot more blockchain and, um, and a lot more uh, sort of more of the financial math community getting involved with figuring out you know, how to keep the regulators happy. Well, have a wonderful day and a great weekend. Yes, you too. Thanks, Alex.